Okay, the recording's working, so at least that's that's working tonight. Um, so as far as getting your assignments turned in, you can go over here to the course calendar. Um, but another way would be to uh, go over um, go over here to this to do list, and it'll show you what you have to do. And, and then these things kind of get checked off the list as you get these items done. So um, you can see this is like my, my test student login. And so there's a bunch of stuff that I haven't done under this login. But um, let's say I, um, you know, it shows you the announcements have the little speaker. This is, you know, quizzes have, you know, the little um, uh, spaceship thing looking there. Let's go to this tires lab sheet. So I'm gonna click this thing. And it says, hey, you didn't do it. It's missing. Submit assignment. Now, um, what you have to do is upload that file, right? And I realize it's kind of a pain. In fact, it wasn't until, it wasn't really until I was doing the breaks worksheet that I realized that, oh, you know, it'd be easier is if I also put that link here. Everything in the class was made to work off of modules. So if, if we go to the module that's talking about tires and we go to that assignment, it's thinking about it. If we go to that assignment, that worksheet will be there. But if I try to go to it directly, let me get rid of those scribbles. You you saw that the worksheet wasn't there. All right, so here it is on tires. So if I go to week six assignment on tires, right, here is the worksheet in a fillable format. It's automatically downloading it. I can click it, boom, there it is. Remember what you wanna do is download it first before you begin to fill it out because if I start filling it in out now, testing one, two, three, and then I say, then I click, um, you know, download or whatever, um, and I'll just throw it right on my desktop here. And now I'll open this thing and I'll change my screen share so you guys can see it. There it is, boom. What you'll notice is that my testing one, two, three change that I made didn't, didn't get saved. So you really gotta download it first and then save it. And I'll usually save it as something like with my name on it. So we're gonna go back to the desktop. And it's thinking about it. Tire worksheet form. So the one we're gonna say, tire worksheet, Mr. French, you could put your name on your And now if I save it and I close this thing out, and now I'm gonna do a screen share again. So hang on a minute. I'm getting there. Um, share screen. We're just gonna go to the tires lab. And then we'll go to my desktop. go. I don't know, I've asked my computer to do so much, it's having a bad, bad day. Might have thrown it under documents, although I thought I selected. Hang on a minute. I don't know, let's try this again, guys. Save as desktop. One, two, three, four. Oops. I'll close it out. There's the tires lab one, two, three, four. Now you can see it saved. Oh my goodness, that seemed harder, but I can tell this is gonna be one of those bad computer nights, everybody. Anyways, um, so if we go back to our class and I will change my screen share again to make it just a little bit easier 
maybe to C. Um, you know, everything was set up under modules. Well, I realized last week when I was working on the breaks that it would be really handy to have the worksheets and stuff on there. So let's go back to the, let's go back to that homepage. And if I go, I'm gonna close some of these out. Oh, maybe I already did the breaks. I'm like, why is that not coming up over here? Probably because I did it. So I'm going to go to the calendar. And there it is. Okay, break inspection, lab sheet. What I did, in fact, I'll open up this whole page, guys. Um, you can submit your assignment right here. I also put a direct link in there. So that made that particular week a little easier. Um, but again, everything's really kind of set up for you to go through the, the modules. You can at least see what's coming up due and when. Um, it always takes a while for it to open these PDFs in like the quick view window. So it's usually a lot easier just to click this thing, get it to download it, and boom, it's already there. It was still trying to open it up in that window and, and it's already here. So. Um, with this um, with this break slab that we were going over last week, um, we were talking about breaks and, you know, I get that you might not be, you, you know, you might have access to a car, you might not be able to take the wheels off of it to look at the brakes. If you have wheels that are like rims with open spokes, if you could kind of look in there and at least halfway look at the pad thickness or something, just note down here at the bottom, or maybe you can type in the comments. In fact, this is what you can do. Let me go back. When you click submit, right, you can throw a text entry in there along with your worksheet and say, you know, I did not have tools to remove wheels or something. Just so I, I, I know, right? So then that, that will send that to, to me when you, when you submit the um, assignment. So, and then of course you see the confetti and stuff, you know, uh, you submitted it. Um, let me go back to this uh, lab sheet. That's funny, it's, it's still trying to open it for whatever reason. Um, but the idea with this was that it would get you doing, you know, you're not doing a break job, but you're doing a break inspection, okay? And so I think what I would like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about this worksheet and ways that you could um, ways that you could uh, do a break inspection even if you didn't have a bunch of tools and, and stuff like that. Just so you have an you have an idea of oh man, am I going to need breaks or not? Um, okay. Um, all right. Okay, uh, I got a message here on the chat about redoing the getting to know you. I'll tell you what, uh, give me a minute and let me finish this thought here on breaks. We'll reopen up that thing, okay? So uh, hang on just a minute. So, um, you know, I know we're, we're kind of stretching things a bit. We're trying to make this work for you guys. My, my recommendation is this, right? Like, we have very limited access to working on hands-on stuff, right? But if you're in this class, I figure you, you wanna know more about cars. What I would do is I would focus on that knowledge side and try to learn everything that you can. In the summer, we're gonna have a class called AT100. That's, I'm sorry, this is AT100. Class called AT140. This Zoom thing not working has got me all spun out. Um, a class called AT140 Skill and Speed Development. You can take that class up to four times and it's essentially 100% lab, lab time, okay? Every, every day you show up, you're gonna be working in the shop. What I'm gonna do with that class is the lecture stuff will be online and the lecture stuff basically con consists of a bunch of tech tips and information on how to use various machines and pieces of equipment in the auto shop. Um, so what you don't get to do right now this semester, what I really would love for you guys to do is come you know, 
see me and, and sign up for that 140 class and we'll get you plenty of hands-on time, I promise, okay? Now, back to this brake steel. Um, if you can view your brakes kind of through the wheel, if you have a, a wheel that's open enough where you can see that, you know, maybe that's all you can do. Well, then look in there and see what you see. Um, see if the, what the condition of the rotor looks like. So I'm going to type just this into, into Google so we can get some images since we're kind of off my, off my script tonight. Um, and, uh, oh, let's, let's say um, you look in inside there. Okay, this is a good one. So you look inside there and you see you, you see this, right? Maybe even the, the wheel is uh, kind of in, in the way. Um, but if you, can, if you can look in there and see the condition of the rotor, that itself can tell you a lot, okay? For instance, let me get those drawing tools back up, guys. If the rotor is really worn down, what you're gonna see on the edge, in fact, I'll draw it on, on this one since we can see the edge over here, is that there's gonna be a lip on the outer edge that goes out and then goes down because the pads don't rub all the way to the outside edge. So they'll almost be like a ring on the very outside where the rotor's not worn. In fact, if I look at this one right here, see how there's that ring around there? That's that rotor is pretty darn worn. Now he's taken the caliper and stuff out of his way, but I could have seen that even even with there. Like this thing has a big lip on the outer edge. That rotor's pretty worn. And you know, nine times out of ten, you see something like that. You're not going to be able to turn it out on a brake lathe. That rotor is going to need to be replaced. Okay. Um, here's another one that would need to be replaced. Where did it go? Um, no, not that one. Oh, there's a slaughter. So see how this one has some bluing and stuff where it's darker there. In fact, I'll try to highlight some of this stuff here. Um, it's got a kind of a blue spot there, kind of a blue streak there. What that means is the metal has discolored due to excessive heat. And odds are that rotor is warped. In fact, remember, if your brake pedal, and I'm gonna just draw a brake pedal right here. And uh, here's my big, you know, Ronald McDonald shoe foot stepping on that brake pedal. If I feel brake pedal pulsation, like it's, it's pulsating back and forth as I'm stepping on the brakes, or I notice when I step on the brakes, I get a steering wheel shimmy, Odds are I have, I have warped rotors and there's different ways they could be warped. They could have a parallelism problem that would give you more of the pulsation. They could have a run out problem that would give you more of the steering wheel shimmy. But you know what? I don't care about that. Like if I have either one of those things, I, I'm thinking in my head, okay, I probably need to replace those rotors or I would need to turn them on a lathe. And I'll tell you that most rotors today come thin enough that, you know, oftentimes by the time they're warped bad enough for you to feel it, they need to be replaced, okay? Um, so you can look, you can learn a lot just by looking, maybe looking through the wheel and looking at the rotor uh, itself, okay? Um, and if nothing else on your brake inspection worksheet, if, if you could do that, that would tell you quite a bit. Now, it asks you to measure some thickness of brake pads or shoes. And we measure that thickness in 30 seconds of an inch. In fact, let's, let's look at a brake thickness gauge. Now it's gonna look something like this. And they come in different measurements. So two millimeters, three, four, five. And then of course, I guess, you know, here's a metric one. These also come in 30 seconds. In fact, a lot of them, if you flip it over, it gives you a 30 second reading. Um, in fact, let's go back. Let's see if we can find uh, another one that tells us stuff. 
all these look like they're well metric is a lot more popular um I think it's just showing you, okay, combination. A lot of these will list 30 seconds on one side and millimeters on the other. So there's two millimeters. Anyways, I guess you'll just have to take my word for it, but there we go. We're measuring the thickness. I like that one with that little tip on the end so you can sneak through that way and measure it. In fact, Let's uh, let's maybe zoom in on this picture, okay? So you can see we're doing a quick quick measurement there. There's usually a window in the caliper where you can get to the inboard pad. Um, you know, this thing's a special tool, but you can see these things only cost ten bucks. So these are they're not super expensive, but it's a great way for you to judge. But I don't know if you guys remember my tech tip from last week. And so um, with that, let's see if there's another way I can make this picture. Look, that guy's doing it through the wheel right there, right? Um, so my tech tip here is if I kind of move some of these things out of my way, there he's doing it there. There's this one here. I'm going to Boy, we're having a bad, I want this picture. I want to, every time my mouse over it, it wants to go so far. Got it, boom, take that. And we will, okay, so, um, what I wanted to get to here was that, I don't know why that was so difficult, but you can see in black here is, it's still a terrible picture. No, I'm, I'm getting rid of this. Um, so if the, the backing plate which would be, let's see if I can get my, oh, I know what I'll do. We'll get them, we'll outsmart them. We'll go here, there. So see how this back part of the brake pad, gosh, that was really difficult, uh -huh. is that's the metal piece, that's the backing plate. My rule is if the friction material, this part here, right, the lighter gray, is if it's the same thickness or less than the backing plate, it's time to think about replacing those brakes, okay? Once, if you look at the thickness of the backing plate, this image doesn't do it justice, but it's usually, you know, somewhere around 430 seconds or so thick, okay? That'd be like three, maybe four millimeters. Um, once the backing plate gets, or once the friction material gets to be that same thickness or less, it's really close to going metal on metal on the rotors, right? So that's when you want to, you want to pounce on there and change it before. So, so you can look through the wheel. So now I'll get rid of this picture again. You can look through the wheel and usually get a pretty good idea. So if we come back to this brake sheet, um, and I clear all my scribbles here. Um, obviously we got some stuff here with tire pressures. W remember as a professional uh, tech, anytime a car, you look at any car comes into your shop, you're required to measure the tire pressures now. So I think we talked about that when we were talking about tires. Um, so that's why the tire pressure's on there. Um, you know, measuring the thickness, you saw how, how that was done. Um, good visual inspection. You know, if, if you had a, a disc brake micrometer, you can measure the thickness of that. We'll get into um, uh, using micrometers later on in the semester. But I did want to point out one other thing is well, that's kind of cool on this worksheet, guys. 
is it's got our conversion factor right here. So the number I always remember is 25.4 in that there's 25.4 millimeters in one inch. So if I want to convert between one to the other, it's pretty easy. Um, if I want to go between inches to millimeters, just multiply it by 25.4. Um, if I wanted to go from millimeters to inches, I could divide it by 25.4 or some folks like this one where you multiply it by uh, point, um, 0.3937. So anyways, it's got that nice little conversion chart on there. If you did take your wheels off, remember you'd really want to torque the wheels back on and that's why it asks you for that on the worksheet. So with all these worksheets, download them to your computer, do your best job possible filling them out. And I understand that there's some parts you may not be able to fill out. Um, uh, you know, put that down under the, the, um, the text, right? Where you can, you can add some text to your, your uh, submission. Let me get rid of these drawings. We'll get rid of that since it never did open up and that. Um, and uh, anyways, you could do a text entry like I did before. Um, you can say, I couldn't take the wheels off or whatever. Um, and always try to make lots of comments on any time you're doing an inspection. Always, you know, like I've gotten a lot of worksheets from people that are related to underhood inspection or undercar or whatever. And uh, the worksheet says everything's okay. okay. Now I find that the average car, if it's more than like two years old, there's going to be something that it's not okay. Um, always make comments like, what are your recommendations? If, if somebody brought you their car to look at, they're, they want you to, they want some type of comment. Um, so, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's com comment is, hey, everything looks okay. I recommend you rotate your, your tires every five to 6,000 miles, right? Um, and, and that could spur something like, oh, I've never rotated my tires. Hey, let's do that now, even though the wear looks okay. Um, there, there's always something that you can see um, on an inspection and there's, there's always a recommendation you can make, right? Oh, the, if your tire wear <laughs> looks weird, maybe it's uh, rotate the tires and maybe recommend an alignment get done on the car. Or um, if the, um, the brakes look good as far as your visual inspection, but they're noisy, uh, maybe you recommend switching brake pad compounds to an organic compound that, that's a quieter running pad. So anyways, always try to, to flush out some comments on any inspection because that's what the, you know, yeah, I'm trying to present it from like the professional shop point of view. That customer brought you their car because they want your, their, your opinion on it, right? So um, always, you know, try to figure out something, even if everything looks good. It could be like, I recommend brake system looks okay at this time. Recommend changing the brake fluid every two years, right? Boom, something. Okay. So that is enough of me beating you up about how to do the worksheets. Hopefully that answers um, uh, some, of your, uh, some of your questions that you might have on how do I submit some of these assignments, right? Everything is set up I'm going to go ahead and leave this thing, go back to the modules tab. Everything here is set up uh, so that you really, you would click modules and go week to week to week to week and kind of roll through things that way. You'll see that every week there's all kinds of supplemental information, right? Like how to tell the age of your tires or, or whatever. And then at the end, it'll say, hey, this is the assignment. If you click that, the most important stuff, the most important links and everything will be under that assignment. It will have the lab sheet, it will have the little quiz. And basically what we've done all semester long is we talk about a section of the car, whether it's the brakes or just getting to know your car overall with, you know, or an underhood inspection or whatever. And there's always gonna be a little quiz and then some type of worksheet that you would do, okay? And so the links for that stuff will be in the modules. Now, let me get back to the, the chat because uh, there was some folks and they were, they were um, asking about, um, they were asking about opening some things up. And now, 
Um, I'm trying to see, I'm trying to see what, uh, what that was. It was a, oh, I think it was a beginning to know you discussion, right? Let's fix this up right now, guys. I'm gonna leave the student view. I'm doing it right now so I don't forget to do it. And of course, whenever I try to do something like that, it seems like my Zoom controls are in the way. This is the, the struggles of teaching now in 2020 and 2021. All right, we're going to go to discussions and we're going to see if we can get this getting to know you thing figured out here. I'm going to click it and I'll edit it and we'll open this thing up so that even if it's uh, late, you can still do it because I'd rather you guys do stuff than not do it. All right, boom. There you go. May 7th. That should be plenty of time. To for you to post something. All right, so that should that should be fixed. Now let me go back to the chat because there was a couple other things. Um, oh, okay. So the question was, um, okay, there's a couple questions and these are really good. Thank you for asking these. So one of the questions um, was, well, what about measuring the thickness of the rotor or the drum, right? Measuring rotor, I didn't spell that right, but rotor thickness. I didn't spell that right either. Okay, we can see how I'm doing today. So they have special micrometers for that, right? And uh, back in my day, I used ones that looked like this, kind of kind of old school there. That's the style I have. But now a lot of shops are using these digital ones. So if you were gonna measure the thickness of that rotor, you know, that's really the tool that you would want to have, and you'd want to write down that exact measurement, okay, on your brake inspection, uh, uh, you know, worksheet or invoice, and oh gosh, look look at this one. You know, I've, I've seen, I want to say three or four cars that actually drove into the shop like that. Um, it, I mean, you see some scary stuff. There's, the little cooling fans are underneath the metal of the rotor, right? You can see those there. He's worn all the way through the outer part of the brake pad and he's rubbing on the fins. I've seen that happen multiple times. In fact, I had one where the rotor was worn into two different spots, like that guy right there. I mean, you just see some really, really scary stuff. Um, but the question that was on the chat was, well, how do I measure this stuff? Well, really, honestly, you're, you're gonna need a tool to measure that, okay? But remember, my tech tip is this. My tech tip is, if you look at this rotor and you kind of look at it from the side and it, it kind of, it goes out and then it's kind of worn and then goes in. So I'll draw it over here too. It goes out and then where the brake pads actually wear it, it's worn and goes in. You know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you nine times out of 10, you're gonna need new mo rotors because the brake pads have worn it down so much that there's a, there's a lip on there, right? Where the brake pads weren't touching. And if you've lost that much material where you can see that lip, it's it's done okay so if you're just doing a quickie break inspection at home what i'll say is look for the chamfer on the edges now um maybe this picture will uh, even on this one it's a little hard to see but on a brand new rotor so i'll change my color here so it's a little easier on a brand new rotor it's, it's kind of hard to see but it would have um here's the fins in the middle and then it has the metal and then it goes out and it actually is a chamfer like this at like a 45 degree angle and then goes down. And that's to help you slip the new brake pads on. So it goes out, it goes over and it's got this chamfer and goes down. So if, if there's no chamfer, much less if there's a lip worn on there, then that tells you that rotor is, is more than likely worn down below its ser minimum serviceable limit. And you're gonna wanna replace that rotor, okay? To follow up, um, if you had bluing and hot spots and stuff on there, um, those all those things would be, hey, I replaced the rotor. But yeah, there's really not a good way for you to measure it accurately without a disc brake micrometer, okay? Um, for drums, it's similar, different tool, and it's going the opposite direction. Measuring drum. Today's a bad spelling day for me. All right, here we go. Um, 
Oops. <laughs> Break drum. I didn't think it was going to give me that. Okay, there we go. So, uh, this is probably the best. Well, here, this is a picture out of some type of training manual or something. Um, that is an old school drum micrometer. And those, those things were actually ridiculously expensive. Here is, uh, here's another one. Now they have some new digital ones that are, that are cheap um, or cheaper than this thing was like $600. So, um, but, you would, but as the drum would wear out, it would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so once the diameter was above its maximum diameter number, that's usually stamped into the drum here. Um, there's another picture of one that's stamped in there. Um, then it's time to replace the drum. But again, you can look for that, that, that wear. If I looked at the edge and there was a big lip, worn on the edge then you, you're you're likely getting to the point where that drum needs to be replaced okay so drums have a maximum diameter discs have a minimum thickness okay so yeah long answer to your question but yeah you really do need some special tools oh here's the new new style you do need some special tools to really do that uh accurately that's what you would need to have in the shop again look for that lip, look to see if there's chamfer there. If there's not, you know, I'm going to recommend replacement. I'd rather err on the side of, um, you know, being too safe than not being safe enough, right? Okay. Um, I will check the chat one more time to make sure I got. Oh, there was a question about hosing or tubing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, brake lines. Okay, so let's look at this picture right here. It's a little, it's a little graphic from a, a Jeep, but um, it might be hard to tell here, but a typical brake system will have metal tubing or brake lines as we call it, that runs the length of the vehicle, runs towards, towards the back, it runs towards the front, but because the, the suspension has to move up and down and the front wheels steer and stuff, we're gonna have to have a brake hose. Um, this one has a solid rear axle, so it's got a brake hose right here. And then of course I'd have to have a brake hose going to each wheel, right? So every automotive brake system in modern times, once you get past like Model Ts and stuff that has a hydraulic brake system, it's gonna have a, a combination of some metal brake lines and some brake hoses at the ends, okay? And those brake hoses, you know, they're more likely to be damaged. Um, they, the hose does get old. So if it looks like it's all old and cracked and, um, you know, it, it's a good idea to replace that stuff, okay? Uh, the brake lines usually are pretty, you know, worry-free unless someone didn't ever change their brake fluid and it got really nasty in there or it was a truck or maybe a Jeep and they ripped this line up crawling over some rocks or something. Usually the brake lines themselves are, you know, pretty robust. And, you know, maybe when the vehicle hits 10, 12 years old, uh, you know, we'll change those, those brake hoses out of there. I have had some brake hoses that, that swelled. I've had some brake hoses that, that seat fluid. So, you know, I always look at these hoses at the, at the end to see if they're, you know, if they look like they're in good shape, here's a, get rid of those scribbles there. There's what a kind of a brake hose would look like. Let me get a different one because that's really for a trailer. Um, I guess I got some fancy uh, brake hoses, but these are these are fancy because they're steel braided, so they should give you a firmer pedal. Here's um, here's a variety of uh, different brake hoses. So I always look at the the wrap on the outside. Does it have cuts or nicks on it? Does it? Uh, is there any sign of it leaking around where the ferrule gets crimped to the hose? Um, that type of thing. And if you know if the car is really here's some just standard ones. If the car is is really old and the brake hoses look like they're the original equipment and they're 20 years old, wouldn't be a bad idea to replace them. 
I have had the brake hoses get soft and you jam on the brakes hard. Instead of it moving the brakes, it just spreads out the hose. Okay, so hopefully that answered uh, that question there. All right, so I'm back at the modules tab and really what I wanted to talk to you guys about tonight was getting ready for, again, for next week. We always, we always try to work one week ahead of what's actually due, right? So what's due this week is uh, the brake inspection and the little tiny brake quiz. Um, so that's what we were talking about last week. There'll be a, a, the YouTube video recording of last week's class. Um, tonight, what I wanna get to is we're getting ready for our midterm exam. Now this midterm exam is, is an ASE style uh, certification test. And so that's why I have some links here for ASE tips and tricks, okay? So there's not gonna be any new labs or worksheets or anything. It's getting ready for this midterm. So I'm gonna just take this hot link here over to ASE. And uh, ASE for our industry, for working on cars is a big deal, guys. It's a big deal because you know this, this impacts uh, you know, our pay, right? So a lot of shops for every ASC that you have, you can make more money. Um, ASC, if I click this about ASC thing, they've been around since the early 1970s and they, they're an independent nonprofit organization, okay? Their whole goal was try to make the mechanics pres uh, profession more professional. And, uh, you know, I would venture a guess that, you know, there was probably more, there was less safeguards and stuff back then. So there's probably more people getting cheated out of money uh, by repair shops and stuff. And we had a pretty bad reputation. So the idea was, is to, to show some level of um, knowledge and, and dedication to the field. And when you get ASC certified, you get these patches to wear on your sleeve. In fact, this, this guy right here, he's got the gold patch there. So that's the master ASE patch. And uh, you know that, that would command you a higher wage than somebody that didn't have it. So let's, let's learn about these ASE tests real quick. So I'm gonna go to tests and what does ASE, I mean, they have all kinds of different tests. The big ones for automotive, I mean, they got tests in like school buses and stuff, okay? So I'm gonna click test series and you can see like uh, uh, transit bus, I mean, just all kinds of crazy stuff. But the normal ones for us are the A series, the automotive tests. And what they do, and I'll, I'll make this a little bit bigger so hopefully it's easier to see on your screens. Um, what they do here is, is they take the car, they divide it up into sections. So A1 is injury repair. So it's just focused on internal combustion engines, okay? A2 would be automatic transmission. So it's not focused on all different types of transmissions, just automatics, right? Um, I'm gonna go down here to um, this one. It's just the heating and air conditioning systems on the car. So they take in the car, they divided it up into its different subsystems and focus in on that, okay? If you get A1, if you pass the test for A1 through A8, you can get that master ASE certification, okay? Now, um, those are our normal ASE tests, but ASE realized a few years ago that, oh, you know what? What if, what if you're just working, let's say you're working at uh, a Jiffy Lube or something like you're just kind of getting started in the, um, in the industry. It'd be nice to have a test that's kind of a little bit of everything. And that's what this one is, the Automotive Maintenance and Light Repair Certification or G1 as they call it. Um, I don't know why it's, you know, not like MLR1 or it, I don't know why it's G, but anyways. Um, the, the G1 basically is a little bit of knowledge of each system of the car, okay? So if I, if I were to think of what ASE test lines up with our 18100 class, 
it would be this G1. And this would be a good ASC to get if your goal was to get that entry level job in a shop, because it shows that, hey, you have a little bit of knowledge in, in all the areas. Uh, a lot of uh, shops and dealerships would, would really like to see that you had that. It shows your commitment to, um, to your knowledge in the industry, um, that type of thing. In fact, if, if, if you guys registered to take this thing, I, I, you'd, you'd have to study your, your, your quite a bit to pass it um, uh, because, you know, as it shows here, there's 55 questions, but, but I would give you, you know, extra credit just, just for signing up and doing it because I'll tell you what, it's, you would learn something through the experience of, of getting signed up and taking this test because it is, it is intense. And what I have found over my uh, many years of teaching automotive now is my students who sign up for an ASE test they always do better in the class because they're trying to get all the information they can because they want to pass that test. And uh, even if they don't end up passing the test, they usually end up doing, you know, uh, a couple grade levels higher in the class because they were that much more involved. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to download this free little study guide right here. And we're going to look at this thing because this will be kind of how your midterm exam is. Your midterm exam is not going to be this hard, to be honest with you. But it's going to be in this style, in this formatting, because one of my jobs for you guys is if you wanted to be a professional uh, technician someday, would be to help prepare you to, so that you can get ASC certified, right? That's, one of, that's one, of my, one of my goals there. So let's, let's check this thing out, guys. We're going to scroll, um, uh, you know, scroll down. It gives us a nice little overview. It talks about how it's in English and Spanish. And, and it tells us how many class, how many questions are on here, okay? And uh, how much time do they give you? And uh, I guess one thing to, to note down is that once you get your ASC certification, uh, you're not out of the woods yet. Uh, every, every five years, you have to recertify. So I have like a bunch of recertifications I need to do right now. And my, for whatever reason, my account with ASE is all messed up and I'm going to have to call them because I can't get it to reset my password so I can get in there. But yeah, every five years, you have to recertify your ASEs because we know that the technology of cars is always changing. And so these tests, they also update and change to, to keep in line with what's going on with the cars. Okay. So, you know, when I first took ASE tests, there was no questions on hybrid cars or electric cars. I mean, that, that stuff wasn't, wasn't out there. And, and now even in this G1, you might find some questions about a hybrid vehicle. Um, so let's see what we got here. So we have nine questions about your engine, four questions about your automatic, six questions about a manual, a bunch of suspension and steering questions, a bunch of brakes questions, and a fair amount of electrical questions, right? Well, why is that? Well, you know, when you're, when you're getting started in the industry, right, some of the most common stuff that you do and you do a lot of is brakes and suspension work, right? If you think about it, you drive around town, you're going to go by, past the big old tires, a Lesh Swab, a Firestone, uh, Walmart has a tire shop in it, right? Like every, you know, that's, everybody does that. And even the dealerships, they, they're doing that type of work too. So that's, that's kind of a, another one of our bread and butter areas of our, of our industry. Even if it's an electric vehicle and it doesn't have a regular gas engine, guess what? It still has brakes. It still has tires. Um, so that's why that's where the bulk of this test is. Um, and then you go, well, why is like the electrical is number three? Hey, cars are so electrically controlled anymore. You have to have some electric knowledge. Um, and so there's, in all the ASE tests, it seems like there's a pretty good emphasis on knowing electrical, okay? One of my recommendations for students as they go through the program is take the electrical class early rather than late. Don't wait till the end to take the electrical class. Get it out of the way early. Get that electrical knowledge loaded in your, your database here because it will apply to every area of the car these days. Okay, so this next part, these are the things that they would like you to have done before you, you know, go get uh, ASC certified in the G1, right? Like a task, a G1 level tech should know how to do is how to 
replace a thermostat or replace and adjust drive belts, change the oil and the oil filter, reset the little oil in, um, maintenance life indicator. Um, inspect and replace belts and water pumps. Uh, look, they even have a thing here on diesel exhaust fluid. Um, retrieve and record diagnostic trouble codes. We'll talk about that later in our class. So um, these are the types of tasks. And you'll see that some of this lines up with what we've done or talked about. And some of this is kind of way beyond. It's, 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 it's much more uh, involved. But then you also see some crossover, like here's the data trouble codes again. Okay. Um, a lot of suspension stuff, right? wheels and tires, dismount, mount tire. So anyways, this might be a class that, or a test you'd wanna take after you've done the skill and speed class. And if you're in skill and speed, you know what I do? Is I'd start, I grab this list and go, okay, well, um, I want to, I wanna to try to do these things. I wanna dismount and mount a tire. I wanna balance a tire. I wanna make sure I've rotated tires and just start checking off these things. So, yep, I've done that task. I know how to do that. Yep, I've done that one. I know how to do that. All right, so let's get past all that stuff and let's get to some example questions. Now, what's kind of bogus here is in this little free study guide, they, they essentially give us the answers, but we'll, we'll pick on these questions and see if their answers are right. So um, when you're taking one of these tests, one of the things I need to write here is that you're trying to select the answer that is, most correct. Ooh. What does that mean? That means that you could find two answers that, hey, they, they seem pretty good. They're not too bad, but one of them is gonna be most correct. You know where I've seen a lot of um, people struggle with ASE tests is not people who are beginning like, like a lot of you guys are, is that, um, experienced technicians with years and years of experience in the field, sometimes they get really tripped up on ASE tests because they're trying to answer the question that's most correct. And they think, oh, well, you know what? Uh, that one time I, I had that Ford uh, Festiva and it did have that problem. That's what it was, right? But it's like, okay, well, out of the hundred different cars you've looked at with that problem, 99 of them were something else. That's what you want to go with. That's the one that would be most correct, right? So you're looking, you know, what's, what's the most correct thing? What's, what's going to be the answer to this question nine times out of 10, right? So when changing the engine oil and filter, and this is something actually uh, after our midterm, uh, we'll be getting into engines and then in an engine oil service and stuff. Uh, the technician should do what? Well, install the filter with pliers. See, so you gotta ask yourself, well, is that a true or false statement? No, I wouldn't wanna do that. So I always like to make little notes on these. Tighten the new filter two turns after the seal contact. Maybe I put a question mark because I'm not sure. Inspect the oil flange for the oil filter seal. I feel really good about that one. I'm gonna put a star, that's a really bad star, but I'm putting a star next to it. Install the filter for, with a dry seal. I definitely don't do that. So I start kind of doing process of elimination on these. Um, and then like on this one right here, um, you know, usually it's like two thirds to maybe three quarters, maybe one turn maximum after the seal contacts the base. Um, so they're saying two turns. So yeah, this is definitely the most correct answer for us on this question. But I always like to use that process of elimination to help myself find what is the most correct answer to that question, okay? And if you do that, like I've always been a pretty slow test taker, but I do pretty darn well on these because I take my time, really read these things thoroughly to find the most correct answer. Now let's, let's skip down to this one because we were talking about tires a couple weeks ago and, uh, we were talking about tire wear patterns, right? Like tires will tell a story. They can let us know what's going on with the car's alignment. What about its service? So here's, here's what I notice with this picture. 
is that uh, the outside edge of the tires, that I can see tread, right? Yeah, that's looking pretty good on the outside edges. But on the inside, it's, it's pretty darn worn here. And it looks like it's got like a, maybe a flat spot or a cup spot there. It's pretty worn in the center. It looks like maybe it's wearing through right here. I'll make this red here. It's wearing through to the belts and plies right here in the middle is what I think they're trying to show. So I'm gonna say it's worn in the center. It's cool on the outer edges, which is not a wear pattern you see a whole lot anymore, to be honest with you, in the real world. But that's that's what they're showing us here. Well, that would definitely be a sign of overinflation because the tire is essentially, if you have too much air pressure in there, it gets bubbled out like this. And so then, yeah, it's just gonna wear the spot in the center, okay? Now in the real world, I'll tell you what's a heck of a lot more common is you look at a tire and it looks all scabby on the outer edges. It's all worn there. But in the middle, the tread looks good. And that's usually due to underinflation. So when the tire's underinflated, it kind of lifts up in the middle and wears up the edges of the tire, but not the center. That's actually a lot more common than overinflation. But, anyways, so yeah, D is the most correct answer for this question. And that is something that we, we talked about in class. So that's, that's pretty cool. So there's definitely, you know, you, you know, if you took this test tomorrow, you would find several things in it that we did talk about, but you'd also find some stuff that we just, you know, haven't got to our, haven't got to yet in our class, or it's, it's involved enough that maybe we won't hit it in this 18100 class. Okay. Um, anyways, so I'm trying to find, here we go, here we go. And it's a related, okay, we're, we'll, we'll, we'll attack these, these two on this page. Um, this question here, guys, this is a uh, technician A and technician B question. And how you want to attack these questions, there's a strategy to this. You want to attack these as two true false statements. So it says a tire pressure monitoring system. Uh, TPMS light, ooh, the lights illuminated, right? The lights on. On a vehicle equipped with direct TPMS. Now, does anybody know or remember from a few weeks ago, I know I'm putting you under the gun here, but what, what, what does it mean when we have a direct TPMS, tire pressure monitoring system? What do you think that means, guys? Direct TPMS. Because there's direct and then there's indirect. Okay. And I'll tell you what, everything since I want to say since maybe 2010 or 12 or so, everything is now direct. What do you guys think that means? Any anybody got a guess on that? What do you think? Here's the tire. We're gonna say this is my awesome pink rim. There. Yeah. Nobody's going for it, huh? Man, you guys are really leaving me in the in the weeds here. Um, just filling in this rim, make it look good. Okay. So direct means, guys, that there is a sensor inside the rim it's usually located underneath the valve stem there's a sensor inside there and that sensor transmits a radio signal so here's my radio signal it transmits its radio signal to a computer in the car the tpms computer and tells it okay this is what your tire pressure is your tires at 32 psi for the Let's say left front, everything's looking cool. And, but maybe another tire, maybe the, maybe the right rear 
uh oh, the right rear is at 22 PSI. There's a problem on that one. And that would cause the light to come off. Okay. So direct sensing TPMS systems have sensors in the wheels, which sounds really cool, right? Sounds cool until that sensor takes a, a, a dump because eventually it's going to, it's wireless. It's got to have a battery in there. Those batteries only last about five years before they uh, quit working. And then sometimes you can change the battery, but more often than not, you have to replace the whole entire sensor for a couple hundred bucks a pop and they got to be initialized or programmed. And so anyways, it does add to the cost of the car and you'll see people with a car that's eight years old and they're just rolling around town with the TPMS light on because they don't want to replace the sensors or whatever, okay? Um, anyways, so that a direct sensing system uses that. You might be thinking, well, what's an indirect sensing system do? It's actually quite creative. What they do is they look at the ABS wheel speed sensors. A tire that's low on air pressure will do a different amount of revolutions per mile. And from that, the computer can infer if the tire is low on air pressure. Obviously you could see by the way it works, it's gonna be less accurate, but pretty creative doesn't require extra hardware on the car. But anyways, so this has the sensors in the wheels. Technician A says that low air pressure in the spare tire could be the cause. And you gotta ask yourself, is that true or is it false, right? And you'd have to have some more knowledge. Usually vehicles, if they're going to have a spare tire, that's part of the TPMS system, it would be like an a SUV or a truck with a full-size spare. And those will usually have another sensor inside the spare, okay? So I would say, yeah, that's true. Technician B says inflating the tires to the proper pressure using nitrogen could be the cause. Now this sensor doesn't, it can't tell if it's just regular air or nitrogen or nitrogen is, um, you know, to be honest with you, like regular air that you and I are breathing right now, um, it's 78% nitrogen. So people always ask me like at the racetrack, hey, do you fill your tires with nitrogen? And I say, yeah, I fill them with 78% nitrogen. Oh man, they, this guy really knows what he's doing. Uh, no, that's just regular air. The air that we breathe is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and a mix of a few other little things that are less than a percent or so. Anyways, um, why do people use nitrogen in their tires? It leaks out a little slower. It has less pressure change uh, as it gets hot. So it's, it's dry basically. So you go to some tire shops, like I wanna say Costco would always fill everybody's tires with nitrogen on um, that type of thing. So anyways. The key thing is you don't wanna put moist air in your tires because as they heat up, the air pressure is gonna change a lot. All right, um, so how do I take technician A and B questions? I separate those dudes out into two true false statements. I ask myself, is technician A true or false? Is technician B true or false? And I put it together. In this case, A was true, B was false. So my correct answer here is A and A only, okay? You are gonna see some technician A and B questions on your midterm. So I wanted you guys to be ready for that, okay? All right, we will do one more and kind of wrap this thing up. Okay, this question is about brake fluid. So I wanted to talk about it because it's something we were talking about uh, last week, right? Um, brake fluid that is not in use, so you're not putting it in the car, should be kept in a closed container. And then we got a whole bunch of options. Of course, you guys have known to cheat by now because it's got the little star. So we know that this is the right answer, moisture contamination. But then we got all these other things. Why is moisture contamination the right answer for this one? What's the deal, guys, with brake fluid and moisture? What do we, what do we talk about that? What do you guys remember? Remember anything from last week? That was a week ago, so that's difficult, but I'm sure we talked about this one. What do you guys think? Hmm. 
one of the things I know I said is I really like to change that brake fluid out of there every two years. Why? Because brake fluid is, let's see if I can spell this. It's hydroscopic, meaning that it sucks moisture out of the air, okay? It's designed to do that, to suck the moisture and hold it in suspension until it sucked up too much moisture and now it's so loaded with water, it can't do its job, okay? So my recommendation that I made last week was like, if you got an old bottle of brake fluid that's been opened and it's been sitting on your shelf in your garage for the last three years, don't use it. It's saturated out, it's done, okay? I, I don't buy like the huge bottles of brake fluid. I usually buy a bunch of the little bottles. So I use the brake fluid and I use a whole bottle and I, you know, I don't end up with a lot of wasted fluid because um, it literally pulls the moisture um, out, of the, out of the air. And that's why we want to change it out of there every two years to keep that brake fluid nice and fresh so that our boiling point of the fluid is as high as it's supposed to be, okay? At the racetrack, we, you know, the, the, sometimes guys are changing their brake, you know, they're, they're bleeding their brakes and, and, and changing out the fluid in between race sessions. They have a really hard brake pedal. Um, I'll usually uh, at least ble bleed my brakes uh, every, every event or maybe at least every other event. So um, uh, tire sidewalls, this is something else we talked about. What, all the information on the sidewalls like P275, you know, uh, 50 R15, like it tells us the size, it tells us the maximum pressure, it, it tells us who made the, the tire, the load class, but you know what it doesn't say on the side of the tires? It doesn't talk about minimum tread depth, right? We just have to know, you know, what's a safe amount of minimum tread depth. And, and most of the time it's, you know, I want more than 230 seconds. And remember with, with the penny, if you're using uh, uh, a penny, to check tre tre tread depth. If you can see all of Lincoln's head, that tire is too worn, it needs to be replaced, right? I don't wanna see the top of Lincoln's head, right? That guy was tall, I don't wanna see that. So anyways, um, hopefully that makes sense. Let's pull this back to your class, guys. I know we're going a little bit uh, over time because I wanted it tonight to be short and then we had the mix up at the beginning. Um, so ASE, I mean, it's, it's a big player in our industry, okay? Uh, remember, they're an independent nonprofit. There's no school that you can go to that will just give you your ASEs, okay? I don't care what you see on the UTI commercial. It, they make you think if you go there, you're going to get ASE certified automatically. Nope, that's not the case. You have to go. You have to register for the ASE test, take the test and pass it. And a lot of these ASE tests, in fact, all the automotive ones, um, require you to have uh, two years of field experience, meaning working on cars as a professional for two years. You can substitute one year of that by based on where you're, you go to school. And if you go to school at AR and go through our whole program, that will count towards one year of your field experience. Um, but at the bare minimum, that means you still have to have um, one year of experience working on cars, okay? All right, and you have to pass the test. So I'm gonna pull this thing back to modules. Let's look at that midterm real quick. I'm gonna scroll down to week eight. And the overview says, hey, there's no new stuff. It's to get ready and do the midterm, catch up on old stuff. Okay. So if I go here, I got some more tips and tricks for ASE, because remember, the midterm is like an ASE style test, right? Um, if I, you know what, I'll put, um, I'll click this thing and I'll put student view on. So this is how the uh, midterm will look to you guys. You can click the thing and start going through the questions. It's only 25 questions. Um, and it, it's gonna directly relate to the things that we've talked about in class up to this point, right? So we got the safety data sheet. Here's a technician A and B question. There's another technician A and B questions. And it kind of goes through here and ends up, you know, going through tires, 
here's a, talking about testing shocks, right? There's a couple true false questions, and then there's a brake system question, okay? So that's the midterm. So next week, there won't be any, any like inspection sheets or anything to do like that. It's just get ready and take that midterm and catch up on that stuff. And like I said, it's an ASC style. So remember, one of our jobs is to help you guys get ready to pass ASE tests. And part of that is just building experience, taking the test, right? Just like working on cars, right? As you get more experience doing it, you get better at working on cars, right? Well, as you get more experienced taking these types of tests, you'll get better at taking these types of tests and passing them, okay? I always say, you know, read the questions thoroughly, which usually means you gotta read slower, okay? So if you could, read, I don't know, uh, 200 words a minute, right? Read at 100 words a minute, right? Read slower than you would normally read something and make sure your comprehension is good, right? So, um, you know, sometimes I'll ask, I'll, let me try to find a question that, um, ooh, I need, to, I need to pull that question. I'll fix that one, guys, because we haven't talked about micrometers yet. So I need to pull that out of there. That snuck in there. Um, try to find a question that. Uh, is super complicated. And. I'll look at that. There's overinflation. Mo most of these are, you know, pretty straightforward. Uh, what I was going to say is that, whenever you, you know, when I read a question to check my reading comprehension, I'll ask me something about like, what is, what is this stating or what is it really asking? Me? So it is considered overinflation when your tires are worn just in the center of the tread, right? Well, um, it's, you know, that's kind of a weird statement, but we did talk about how if you do overinflate your tires, that's how it will wear the tires. So what would be the most correct answer for that one? I would say true, right? So just, you know, always read the questions slowly, read them thoroughly, you know, ask yourself, do I understand what this is saying? Maybe read it a couple different ways, um, you know, to fully make sure you understand what it's asking and then answer the, answer the question. Um, you can do this test a couple of times, okay? At the end of your second attempt, it will show you any questions that you missed, and it should show you what the right answers are, okay? So if you're the student that wants to have get everything as perfect as you can, like, you know, you can do it once, and you can study up more. Um, it's going to reorder some stuff, um, but then you, you could have another crack at it. Um, when you're all done, you'll get to see the feedback, and if you see that feedback and you think, oh, Mr. French is wrong on this, you know, screenshot it and email it to me and we'll, we'll look at it, okay? Uh, maybe, maybe there is an error in there. The one error that I just found that I thought I had weeded out was this question right here. I need to replace him with something else because we didn't talk about micrometers yet. I pushed that back further in our semester. Um, anyways, uh, any questions on any of this stuff that we did tonight, guys? Any questions on any of this, any of this stuff? Well, um, that's great, I guess, as long as you were paying attention and you're not just not asking questions because you fell asleep, um, that's, that's good. Ben, can you hear me? Oh yeah, hey Lonnie, I thought I saw, yeah, I saw your name on there, yeah. How's it going? It's going good. Good stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm remembering, uh, you know, uh, some of the mistakes I've made early on. <laughs> just uh, working on yeah. my car. Uh, not checking for that uh, rubber gasket on the oil fill, on the oil filter. Oh the first yeah, time. everybody's done that, right? Okay. I know guys who've been, you know, they're uh, 30 years of experience who who have uh, who have made that mistake getting in a hurry. Yeah, that was my first mistake on my first oil change. There uh, you go. Well, that you get a pass. I'm just. No, I'm asking. So when a student goes in, if they can't find the 
they're sometimes they're going in and looking uh and, and they need to go to the module and look for the thing yeah can i mean what, what i realized can you go back step through that yeah sure One more time for me. but what Sorry. i realized you know this class was really like cheryl and a bunch of our instructors put it together and then i've taken it and tried to modify it and i i realized that oh like there's their their whole system is based on the modules and so if you don't go through the modules it gets a little clunky. There's not a lot of redundancy um, as far as what's going up there. And I'll, and I'll show you a perfect example of that. So if I'm in my student view, so my page will look like the students pages uh, should look other than the pink border. Like I can use this calendar and I can see, okay, what's coming up? What's due on Friday? Oh, the break inspection is due and this week seven quiz is due, right? Well, let me look. Let, the, the, the quizzes are pretty easy. It seems like everybody's able to click these quizzes and do them. If I click this thing, it, it takes me straight to the quiz. That one didn't take me straight to the quiz. Hmm. Okay, we'll have, we'll have to fix that. Let me try another one. It should take me straight to the quiz and it should work. There we go. That, that one worked. Um, I'm going to make a note. Fix the brakes quiz. Break quiz. All right. So the quizzes usually aren't what what messes people up. What yeah. usually messes people up is if I go back to this calendar. What usually messes people up is the uh, the actual worksheet, and um, if they click it. Like I made this breaks one myself. And so I put a link to the worksheet right there, right? And here's the link to submit it. Um, Cause that's kind of my style. But what I realized if I go back to, let's say the tires lab. And if I click this thing, ah, the, the, you know, it doesn't have any shortcuts there, right? So okay. here's how I can submit it. But really what it's built for is use the calendar see what's coming up okay the breaks okay so uh, so now let's go back to our modules so i'll get there here we go and go okay if i let's say i was trying to do the uh tires one scroll through here until you get to week whatever i want to say it's week six okay that's on tires click the assignment and everything will be there. Like there's the worksheet, there's the quiz, you know. So that, I think that's usually where uh, yeah, people get messed up is, is, is you gotta go yeah. through modules. And, um, you know, it works real sweet if you go through modules, but if you go straight to the calendar or you, if you kind of shortcut around another way, then you use, you lose some of these hyperlinks. And um, okay. I'll start playing. And I, I, did, I just didn't realize that's how it was. Like, um, you know, usually Cheryl's stuff is pretty dialed in, but it's, it's her, the what her system and how she does it. And so, um, you know, students started having some students had no problems at all. They boom got it right because they were going through the modules. And I had some students where, I think that's why they were having issues. Um, I had one student that I, I, I can't figure out how why he was having issues at all. Like I. Um, but what I finally did is I just downloaded all the things and I emailed them the worksheets. Done. So, um, you know, I, I what if if the students get a hold of me and they're like, "Hey, I'm having a hard time getting the worksheet," we can make it happen. If nothing else, like they could say, "This is the worksheet I need." I'll I'll email them the darn worksheet, and they can email it back to me. Okay. Well, uh, I think I think now that that I've seen it working, uh, we'll we'll yeah, try that this because I've got a couple of students who. Uh, uh you know they're, they're high school students and they're good students there but they they i think they uh, didn't keep up with where they should have been and some of it was because they kind of got lost and couldn't find the, the worksheet it's it it is a lot it's a lot to take in um so you know i don't have a problem if something's locked let me know i'll unlock it um okay and and i'd rather them do it than not do it don't feel like oh i can't you know They'll lose it. They'll lose a, a few points, um, but even if they waited to the last day of class, like 
the minimum you would get on any assignment turned in late was a, is a C. So turn in all the assignments, right? Like get them done. Um, and then, uh, you know, I've been working on um, some other extra credit things. So it, it you know, I, what I would tell them is, is try to get as many things done as they can. Some of the worksheets they might have to modify. They might have to do something like if they don't have access to a car, um, you know, we have some video clips loaded in here where okay. they can, you know, watch the video and kind of answer questions off of that. They can modify the worksheet and say, look, I just looked through the wheel. Like, you know, I'm trying to make, be pretty flexible so that these guys can get, can get stuff done to the best of their okay. ability. Um, as things are starting to open up, like I know like San Juan Unified School Districts uh, just had announcements today that they're trying to get back into school next week. Um, I would really love to do something like maybe we could, we could meet up at pick and pull or, or something like that. And, um, you know, they, they could do a lot of things in one day and just kind of uh, go around and, and do different things, vehicle inspections. And, you know, you could take the brakes off a car there, you know, anyways, uh, for students that are that feel comfortable in, in doing that. Um, yeah. Oh, that sounds great for me. I'm, of course, I've got my shots, so I can do anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. I to get it's out, of, get out of jail. Yeah, I I just got uh, I just got the first one, and we just got my grandmother through. So we're we're, we're feeling better in our in our family. Like we're feeling like we're starting to get there. But I get it. It's all about what folks are comfortable about doing. And so I'll make sure that there's plenty of um, other things that kids can do to kind of make up for maybe something that they didn't do or they felt like they couldn't do it all the way. But what I would say is, is do, you know, try to focus on do what you can, right? Like modify the worksheets, type, type some stuff in there. Um, I'll, I'll give you some credit for stuff that you can do. I can also tell pretty easily if like you didn't even look at a car, like I can, I can see, right? Like some people on the, like they had stuff way off, like their numbers didn't even make sense or, you know, so and then I'll usually ask them questions like, uh, try that again. That doesn't make sense. Or show me a picture of this, right? Or something. Um, yeah. You know, so just as long as they're, they're trying to do stuff and, and, and trying to improve their knowledge, uh, I, you know, I think we'll get them some stuff through here. And then, like I said, if they really want to get hands on, you know, or it's our goal to have uh, skills being run in the summer and I'll be teaching it in the fall. And, and I'm basically going to take over the skill and speed program uh, class now that um, I've lost John McCormick to other things. Okay. So, all right. So are you guys going to be hands-on next uh, semester? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Mean, so, so we're going to be um, what the school is calling a hybrid, which gets all my automotive teachers all mixed up because they're thinking about hybrid cars, but um we're going to be a mix where we have some classes that will still be a hundred percent online, right? Any class that the district has chosen, like that class can be taught online. They're going to keep us running that class in an online format, but the classes that you can't convert, they're not possible to convert to online like skill and speed class, like the brakes right. class, like the engines class, those classes will go uh, in person. But what we're going to do is we're gonna divide up those classes um, uh, to an A group and a B group. And so we only see half the students at any one time and we'll put the lecture uh, online. So why I say it's gonna be a hybrid is that the lecture stuff will be online, but the lab stuff will be in the shop. The students are gonna end up with a little bit less lab time, but they're only gonna have eight students in a class. And so, you know, I find in that in my classes, oftentimes um, students might be waiting for me to, to, to look at something or so I think with having less students in the class, um, uh, even though that we have a little bit less time, I think I think they're going to be able to get all their tasks done and they're going to have a, a great time. So that's that's what we're that's what we're shooting for right now. In fact, I was just trying to punch up this. Um, summer schedule yeah i did suck that okay so we got it here um okay so like we this summer we have an at 100 that's online that's just like what i'm doing right now but like i'm going to be meeting online now i'm trying to get this fixed 
I really, the class is going to go from eight to three Tuesdays and Thursdays because I'm taking the lecture time and using it. But if a student's in group A, maybe they're only showing up every Tuesday and a student in group B is only showing up every Thursday and the day that they're not in school, that's when they can do any online activities. For the skill and speed class in particular, my online content is going to be focused on like tech tips of how to do different jobs and how to use different pieces of equipment, right? Like this is this, watch this video clip of how to use the tire machine, answer these questions. So the goal is like when they walk in the shop, boom, they're kind of more familiar with how to use the equipment and they can make really good use of their time. And then we're not just standing around, you know, talking like we're, we're ready to hit the, the ground running. So, yeah, um, that sounds great. so, so you'll see that the majority of these classes um, like the air conditioning, same thing. Jennifer's going to be doing that. Engine performance is going to be in person. Um, you know, it's going to be a tough go though. Cause like I had to lower the maximum class size for social distancing. I think that's right. how it's also going to be in the fall. And, and I'm trying to run as many classes as I can in person, but I, I'm also trying to keep everybody all spaced out. So yeah, um, that's, that's what we're working towards. I, I think it will be, I think it will be good. I'm looking forward to getting back in the shop and working with the students. And I know all the other instructors are too. And I'm sure these guys are anxious to get back in the shop. So uh, for, for a lot of your students in particular, I would say, you know, they'll still have to kind of feed through that 100 and kind of get some, uh, maybe some basic knowledge, but I'd love to see them in AT140 whenever they can jump in there. um, Got it. And do so. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So much. Hey, thank you. you. Take care. And uh, good, good to talk with you always. All right. Okay. And the rest of you guys, hey, you guys have a good night too. Okay. All right. Bye everybody.